think this is the fourth week we've been in here. I'm going to try to finish this chapter tonight, Lord willing, get through this chapter. I thought I'd finish it last week, but we didn't. What in this chapter? While you're turning there, I do want to share with you, I met somebody this week that was a blessing to me. I'm not going to share her name or anything. It's an older lady. When I say older lady, I'm going to, I'm going to guess uh, 65, 70 years old in that range. She uh, bumped into them at uh, at a town and country drugstore in Tellersville. I was going to get some medication brief, uh, filled. And when I went in there, you know how most of the stores are, drug stores, you, you have to walk plumb through the store the counters at the back of the store. Uh, you can go and buy your beer and get it right there at the front and get out, but if you want <laughs> drugs, you gotta go all the way to the back of the drug store, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, I, I went in and on the way in there, I uh, seen a woman stand, that the older lady standing there, and a young man had went in just before me. I seen him go in, and then when I got in there, she was talking to him, and she was getting on him pretty good. She was getting on him pretty good. And her husband, I, I assume as her husband was there, she, he, he kind of voiced up, and he said, leave him be, leave him be. And she turned around, and she said, if if they're sorry, mom and dad won't tell them. Somebody needs to tell them. Who's going to tell them? If nobody tells them, they ain't never going to learn. And she turned back around and got on him again. <laughs> and he ended up just leaving. I don't. I didn't see him ever go to the counter. He ended up just leaving. And the husband was fussing at her and, and a little bit. And she just, she just started going on. And she just looked at me and she said, I'm sorry. I just don't have a filter and I'm just so sick of it. She said, I've just seen so much. I'm just so sick of it. I said, ma'am, you ain't bothering me one bit at all. I said, I agree with what I heard. Amen. If somebody don't tell them, uh, they're never going to learn. And, and mom and dads aren't doing it today. Somebody needs to. And I said, I, I applaud you. I applaud you. And it ended up, we got into a conversation, was talking a little bit about some things she had seen and some changes and how, how she was just dumbfounded at the stupidity of today's leaders and the stupidity of today's people. You know what I mean? As far as, you know, there ain't no absolute truth no more. Your truth is my truth. All truth is relative. It all depends on your view and your interpretation of what's true and all this stuff. There's neither male nor female. I mean, she was hitting it all. And she says, I wish somebody would just... And she was one of them loud. Everybody coming in and out of the store and worked in the back could hear her conversation. She said, I just wish somebody explained to me why, how they expect us on a fixed income to keep paying these high prices for everything going up. She said, it just makes no sense. So you know me, I try to calm things down. I said, it's so we can give all these immigrants something when they come across the border. And, oh, 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 boy, they got her going. <laughs> her husband rolled his eyes and shook his head. The lady at the counter come and said, sir, sir, I can, I can, I can help you. <laughs> Try to get me away from her. I done stirred her back up. <laughs> but the reason I wanted to share that with you is because common sense hasn't died. Right. Amen. There's still some people out there that's got good common sense. And I, and I told her before I left that she was a breath of fresh air. That I'd about given up hope. I, I, I said it's good to, to run across somebody like that. Amen? Amen? Now, I wish I'd seen that in a 20-year-old. Right. Amen? I mean, there's some out there, but... They're far and few between. Right. Amen. She lived long enough, she knew that public opinion didn't matter. That's right. She wasn't afraid of what her peers would say about her. You know what I mean? Right. She knew what was right and wrong and what was what was decent what was indecent. Amen. And she didn't mind telling. Uh, one of the things she said to me that was so funny, and I'll get into the study in a minute, but one thing she said to me that was so funny is, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a filter. And I said, that's all right. Every now and then we need to take the filter off. And she, she looked at me and she said, I never put mine on. 
<laughs> I liked that. I said, oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> and I believed her too for was over with, but what a blessing it was. All right. Now, back to our study. 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, we, we made it down through, according to my notes, we made it down through verse 12 last time. And uh, the first section, verses uh, about 1 through 3 there, we was talking about uh, salvation. Now, in the first three verses, we had the salutation. Then, from verse 3 on down to about verse 12, we were dealing with salvation. And there's something that I didn't point out. I did point out, but I, there was a statement that I didn't say last time that I was teaching. Uh, here we go. I don't know if that even works. There it is. Uh, let me read the verse to you and I'll look at verse 11 and then I'll give you what I want to add to last week's and we'll take off from verse 13 on. It says, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand, here it is, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. In the Old Testament, the prophets, according to verse 10 of which salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. The Old Testament prophets prophesied. They, you can find grace in the Old Testament. They were prophesying not what their salvation plan was, but the grace that was to come to us. How many of you have ever heard this statement? They're saved in the Old Testament the same way they're saved in the New Testament. How many of you have ever heard that? A lot of preachers preach that. A lot of Baptist preachers preach that. A lot of preachers believe that. How? I don't know. They ain't reading the same Bible I'm reading. <laughs> but it's clear. They didn't understand it. They searched. They wanted to understand it. Well, they were saved by looking forward to the cross. How many of you ever heard that? Old Testament saints were saved by looking forward to the cross. We're saved by looking back to the cross. That's not true either. That's not true either. They didn't even know Jesus' name in the Old Testament. When the pre-incarnate Jesus did appear to Manoah's, uh, Samson's parents, Manoah and his wife, and they wanted to know who he was, he didn't tell them. It wasn't for them to know. Jacob, he didn't tell them. He wrestled with him. What's your name? It's none of your business. Amen. It's not time for me to reveal that. Amen. He didn't tell they didn't know that. They knew Emmanuel. They knew some, they, they were some things prophesied about Jesus, but they didn't understand it. What did they understand? They understood the sufferings. They knew he was going to suffer. They didn't fully understand it, but they saw his sufferings, and they knew that he was going to reign and the glory that should follow. What they did not see is the church age. They did not see this time period in which we live. Clarence Larkin, he drew a thing called the Mountain Peaks of Prophecy. And he has a man standing over here. Oh, he does a good job. Mine's terrible. I ain't even, even going to come close to being... But he said what they saw was the suffering... And the glory that should follow. There, there's the. I actually should have made that go on in out to the millennium when he's going to rule and reign. That's why when Jesus was here, they kept saying, Without well, now restoring us the kingdom. They weren't looking for a church age, they weren't looking for that. They didn't fully understand the cross when Jesus came uh, and was walking, they were looking for him to set up his kingdom. He was preaching the kingdom. They were looking for the kingdom. They didn't see the time period called grace, the church age. They didn't see it. They didn't see this time period right here called church. And you say, preacher, I don't know about that newfangled teaching. Clarence Larkin's chart, 
If you look on the bottom of the charts, some of his charts, here's the date on the bottom of some of his charts. 120 years ago. That's not a new teaching. 1901, 1900, 1914, 1915, a lot of his charts is in that time. A years up to 120 years, that's been taught and should be understood by the church, and they still don't get it. They still don't get it. It's easy to tell everybody you're saved the same way, but it's not true. You say, what do you mean? Well, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say this, because there's always somebody gets a little upset when you make a statement like that, because they... They've heard it all their life and their preacher said this or their pastor said that or my mama's pastor or my daddy's pastor or whatever. I always believe that and taught that. But listen, when Jesus was here, he was preaching to his own and they received him not. We understand that. Then the gospel goes to the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, he was dealing with the Jew. In the New Testament, it's primarily the Gentiles. In the Old Testament, they were under the law. In the New Testament, we're under grace. They're not the same. The law pointed to grace. It prophesied of grace, but they didn't have that grace. Do you understand it? They knew what they were doing was pointing to something that we were going to get to enjoy. But they themselves didn't get it. Now look at the verse here. Verse 12. Unto whom? Now remember we was talking about the prophets inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. That's us. Then in verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves... But unto us, they didn't minister. They weren't ministering for themselves as much as they were for us. We get to look back and see it clearly. That's an amazing book. Ain't it? It's an amazing book. You say, well, I still believe they were saved the same way. Okay, then how come they didn't go to heaven when they died? They went to Abraham's bosom. They didn't even go to the same place when they died. There was no indwelling Holy Spirit. They were not sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. No eternal security. I mean, that, it was different. Somebody always points out, well, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Somebody real quickly tell me what book Noah was in. Genesis. What book did the law come in? Exodus. Noah was before the law was given. And had he not built the boat, he'd have died with the rest of them. They're different dispensations. God dispensed grace differently at different times to different individuals. Just like when we leave, guess what comes back? The law comes back to play here along with grace. It's the law and grace grace they're going to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because they're on this they're on this side of Calvary and the law because he's going back to dealing with the Jews that's amazing I'll give you one to think about now this one will warp your mind this will warp you where's Jesus going to be sitting he's going to be sitting on the throne here on earth how do you think they're going to be saved during that time? They're going to be saved by putting their faith in the shed blood of Jesus? No. They're going to be saved by works. Right there he says, you better do what he says. Mm -hmm. There's no faith to it. Right there he is. You don't need faith for who you can see. They can see. Does that make sense? So there's different times. Now, Having understood that, hopefully, again, Peter is written in such a way, Peter is right here, right when the church begins. He is writing to the early church. We do have spiritual application for us, but a lot of the doctrine is going to be right here. So it, it basically, a lot of people say it's a dual application. 
I can see almost three applications. It's amazing. It's an amazing book. So let's go ahead and get into that. I think that covered that pretty good. And the reason I do that is because there's a lot of grace preachers today. Grace Baptist Church or Grace Church. They, they put grace in their name a lot and they teach on dispensations. Those grace believers are hyper dispensationalists. And they say Peter did not preach to the church. Peter was just for the Jew in the tribulation. But that's not true either. Peter, Peter agreed with Paul in Acts 15 at the Council at Trent. And when Peter wrote, you can, see, you can see Paul's influence in his writing. Where he's talking about being born again. Being born again, uh, not of corruptible seed, but by the precious blood of Christ. We're going to get that verse in just a little bit. That's all Pauline doctrine. See, what they searched for and diligently wanted to see, the Bible said that even angels in that verse there, if you look, even angels wanted to look into it and understand it and couldn't. I truly believe that even the angels didn't understand God's plan. Had the devil known that Jesus was going to die on the cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins, do you think he would not have fought Jesus going to Calvary? He would have tried to have stopped Calvary. Could you imagine the angels up in heaven watching that unfold? Here's Jesus coming down and he's born in a manger. And they're in heaven like... <sighs> Could you imagine how that must blow their minds? There's God on the throne and there He is. <laughs> born in, he's in the state where He took on flesh. And He walked perfectly. And then all of a sudden, God manifest in the flesh allowed mankind to spit in His face. Pluck His beard. Rip his clothes off and mock him. Beat him. Illegally, illegally, falsely accused him and persecuted him and condemned him to death of the cross. Then they nailed him to a cross. I imagine when they, when they started beating Jesus or when they was getting ready to nail him to the cross, I bet you if you was in heaven you would have heard sabers instead <laughs> of them jerking them swords out. I they would have been legions of angels ready to come at any time. But he came to die. He didn't let them come. They didn't understand that. They do now. But in the Old Testament it's talked about, but we have the luxury of 2020 hindsight, right? right. Now get this. This is going to open up something for you. We have the luxury of looking back to Isaiah 53. And we understand that's Jesus. All the way through, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. But to the Jew in the Old Testament, they didn't see Jesus. That's us, the Jews, suffering for the sins of the world. That's us, the Jews, having to go through all this persecution for the world. That's us suffering. They didn't understand it. You ask a Jew today about Isaiah 53... And some of those places in Isaiah where it talks about the sufferings of Christ. And we know it's alluding to Christ. They'll say, that's the Jew. That's us. They still don't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They missed Him. <clears throat> now, having said that, we have the luxury of looking back and seeing how Old Testament applied to Jesus and pointed to the grace that we're now enjoying. We're reading stuff now that is yet future. We're not going to understand it as good as they are. People in the tribulation are going to look back to Peter and they're going to say, Oh, that's us! That's us! See, we're reading Peter now and we can see how well, this is us but it don't quite sound like Paul. It don't quite sound right. We think it's here, but we're not 100% sure. You know, there's a dual application. They're going to look back and read it and say, yes, that was for them, but it was also for us. <coughs> and it took it a step further. 
And they'll see and understand it clearly because they will be going through it. They'll be living it. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. But anyway, <coughs> I took longer than I wanted to there. Let's keep going. All right, I said we was going to move on uh, well, to number three in your outline is going to be verses 13 through 25. And here we're dealing with service. In verse 13 it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 13, remember the dual application. I'm going to apply it to us today. It says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. To gird up your loins means to pull your pants up. And you know, I, I, I bet that old lady I met at the drugstore would tell them to pull the breeches up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> pull your breeches up, boy. I, have, you, have you ever seen that sign? No shirt, no shoes, no service. No shirt, no shoes, pull your pants up or no service. Amen, amen, amen. amen, amen. <laughs> but anyway, uh, anyway, it's, it means to gird up your loins. That means get prepared, get ready. I don't care. I, I'll never forget this as long as I live. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of uh, dumbest criminals in the world or dumbest crooks in the world? There used to be a program come on years ago. I used to like it. It always showed dumb criminals doing stupid stuff and getting caught. And one of the criminals that was caught was one of those that wanted to wear his pants down. He started to rob a store not knowing there was a cop in the store. When the cop, when the cop came around, he tried to take off running with his pants half down. By the time he got out the door, they was at his knees, and when he tried to make the turn, they was around his ankles, and he was just barely moving till he fell over. The cop was laughing so hard behind him that he was about not to catch him because he was laughing so hard that this guy tried to run. And they recreate a lot of these scenes for you, so they gave you the visual picture. It was just hilarious how stupid some of that stuff was. But anyway, to gird up your loins is to... It, they, they, the way they dressed, they would pull everything up and they would tighten it up so they was ready to go to work. They were ready to serve. They were ready. And then it said, gird up the loins of your mind. You have to prepare yourself mentally. Be sober. That means uh, clear-minded. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to give you a spiritual application, then I'll show you the doctrinal. The spiritual application for us is we're to gird up the loins of our minds. We're to, have to be clear in our thoughts. We should, we should be growing in grace. We should be studying the Word of God. Amen. Memorizing Scripture. And we're looking for something. That hope. Hope. What are we looking for? That's associated with hope. We're looking for the blessed hope. The redemption of this body. Remember last week we, we pointed out how that when we get saved, our soul is sealed forever, but this flesh ain't saved yet. This flesh is still growing old. It's still dying. It's still decaying. When the Lord comes and steps out on the cloud and we go to meet Him, we're going to have our redemption complete. We'll receive that glorified body. There's the end of our faith. Amen? The, the accumulation of our faith, the, the outcome of our faith will be a sealed soul for eternity, which we have now, and in our glorified bodies, which we'll get then. Now, here's the doctrinal application. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Why? Because the Antichrist has been here for a while during the tribulation. Gird up, therefore, the loins of your mind. Don't believe the lie. Don't be deceived by the untruths and false doctrines that's going on in that day. Be sober, be clear-minded, and hope to the end. To the end. You're holding out hope to the end. Why? Because there is no eternal security here. It's, if they receive the mark, they lose it. There's no eternal security in the, in the tribulation. So they're, they're holding out hope to the end. Now watch. To the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you. So they're going to receive some grace. There's different kinds of grace, but they're going to be receiving some grace that is going to be brought to them when? 
at the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does Jesus appear to the world during the rapture? No, he steps out on the cloud and he calls us out of here. There's a disappearance of believers. The revelation, the revealing of Christ is the second advent. And at the second advent, that's what they're hoping for and the grace that they're receiving. And that's at the end of that tribulation period. So you can see what, how that one applies. Let's keep going. Uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now that's pretty well self-explanatory. As children, we're not to fashion ourselves according to that old lusts. We're not to live like we did as lost people. We shouldn't think like we did as lost people. We shouldn't live like we did as lost people. Everything should be different. Uh, when we're saved, the Bible says we become a new creature in Christ. Amen. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When I was lost, now I'm going to say something here. I disagree with homosexuality altogether. Because it's Based on my knowledge of the Word of God is an abomination in the eyes of God. Therefore, I reject it. But were I a lost man, I would be rejecting the Word of God. Who's to say that I wouldn't be arguing for homosexual rights today? Right. You see what I mean? But as a saved man, the man's the way I thought then and the way I think now should be different. The way I behave then and the way I behave now should be different. Right. Okay, that's all that's saying. It's pretty much. It says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. For it is written, I am holy. Verse 16, there is a reference to Leviticus 11.44. That's where God told His children, the children of Israel, to be holy, for He was holy. Verse 17, and if ye call on the Father who without respect of person judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourn here in fear. Now, if you're saved, you know God's no respecter of person. As far as salvation, it don't matter who you are, what color you are, it doesn't matter what you've done. God's no respect of person. He will save for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, he'll save them. Okay, we understand that. Uh, and that we should live and pass our time as we sojourn here in fear. In fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs tells us that. Uh, you also see that in Psalms. But if you want to apply it doctrinally with fear. Oh, let me give you this. Still with us. Why should, why should a Christian have fear? Because we're going to the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. And we're going to be judged according to our works. We're not saved by works, but our works will be judged nonetheless. What I did for Christ, what I didn't do for Christ. If I did it for myself, if I did it for attention, if I did it for money, if I did it for a pat on the back, it's going to burn up. It's gone. If I did it because I love the Lord, I did it regardless of what everybody said, because I love the Lord and because He said do it, that's what gets rewarded. Okay, And the Bible actually calls the judgment seat of Christ the terror of the Lord. In 2 Corinthians 5.11 is where you'll find that. It's called the terror of the Lord. Why is it called the terror of the Lord? How would you like to stand there and every... The motive, the motive behind everything you did is going to come out right there. The motive... Well, preacher, you preached and you did this, you did these great things. But there's preachers that preach for money, yeah. not for souls or not because they love the Lord and not because they're called. That motive's coming out. And a lot of them's going to be ashamed of what they've done. There's a lot of Christians. Well, I taught Sunday school class for years. Well, you did it for the attention and the pat on the back. You did it so you can make contact with other people because you was a car salesman and you wanted to sell cars. <laughs> you see what I mean? There's all kinds of motives that people have that's not right. And it's going to come out. So uh, 
Why you do what you do is just as important as what you do. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. If you don't get nothing else now, that was worth coming for right there. That was good stuff. I, if I did say it, I'm going to sign my own Bible. Watch this. Let's keep going. Verse 18. Uh, if I'm going to get done, I've got to hurry. <laughs> uh, but there's there's a little bit more in that verse there, but uh, that's, that, that'll that give you a good practical application. Now, look at verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Verse 18, we were not saved by our vain, that's empty, void, useless conversation. Conversation that is not our speech, but our lifestyle. The way we live. And that's made plain in, uh, in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Likewise, likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that's the man's laws, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation. Not while they hear, while they behold. It's your lifestyle. It's the way you live. So back in verse uh, 18, for as much as you know you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your vain lifestyle, that's what we were talking about. In uh, verse 14, your former lust and in your ignorance, you know what I mean? The way you were when you were lost, the way you lived then, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Now, that would be the rituals and the ordinance and traditions taught by the Jewish fathers. The fathers there being reference to the Jewish fathers. But I like the fact that it points out we were redeemed. Amen? Redeemed. That means bought back. We were the Lord's. We fell in Genesis 3. Mankind fell. And the God of this world took back over the kingdoms of this world. The kingdom was given to Adam. He was to have dominion over everything. And when they fell, the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the devil, he got his creation back. I have to do something on the kingdoms and show you, the <coughs> show you that one day. But when he got it back, that's why the Bible says, ye are your father, ye are of your father, the devil. John 8, 44, I think is where that's at. The, if you're lost, you're the devil, amen? Until you're redeemed, bought back. He created you, and then he had to buy you. One time a boy had made him a little uh, boat, and he had made that thing really nice, and he would put it in the creek, and he would run down there and get it, and he would put it in the creek. It would come some rains, and the creek was up, and it got pretty swift. And he wanted to see how his little boat was doing. He set it in the creek and it took off and he couldn't catch it. And, me, and it was gone and he cried and he thought, oh, my, my boat, my boat, my boat, my boat. It's gone, it's gone, you know. And on down the stream, about a week later, a farmer was out in his field there by the creek and he noticed something in the creek and he went and got it. And it was a beautiful little boat. He could tell somebody had put a lot of love and time in it and glued everything together good and he just kind of put it on his mantle. He thought that was a pretty neat little find. Well, one day the parents had come by to visit the farmer and had their boy with them, and he seen that boat. He said, that's my boat. He said, no, I found that boat. That boat, that's my boat. And the boy, the boy said, I, he said, that's my boat. He said, I'll sell it to you. And he sold it to him. And on the way home, that boy hugged that boat. He said, you're mine twice. I both made you, and now I bought you. You're mine. That's us, man. Amen. We've been redeemed. You might go to a, a, a pawn shop, and you might pawn a, a, a ring or a guitar, something that's valued to you. It's no longer yours. It's the pawn shops. You have to redeem it. You've got to go back and purchase it back from them. And they give you so long to redeem it before they put it out for sale for the public. That's basically what that is. Amen. Now, let's keep going here. Where did I stop? 
Oh, I could talk about the blood. Oh, my goodness, I hate that I'm skipping this part. For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Works. Tradition. That's corruptible. Amen. Uh, gold and silver. Money don't matter. It's going to burn up. It's going to melt with the fervent heat. Uh, but we were redeemed by what? Look at verse 19. With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. The price to redeem us was a high price. Yeah. It was innocent spotless blood. No man can say that they can do that for us. No man could lay down his life. It took God himself and his blood. Amen. Now, uh, you can just jot this down. Leviticus 17.11, Hebrews 9.22 is good reference on the blood. Uh, I could go in and talk about without spot, being without spot, being a mark. There's a lot there because of that spot that's there, so I'm just not going into that. Uh, we've dealt with the mark of the beast and all that stuff before and talked about the spot and leprosy and so on and so forth. We've already dealt with some of that stuff in other studies. Uh, but the Lamb of God, as, as of a lamb without blemish, uh, the Bible does not say the first accepted sacrifice was that of Abel's. God accepted Abel's sacrifice and rejected Cain's. Therefore, Cain got mad and killed his brother Abel. Okay. It does not say what the animal was. It was without name. But I guarantee you it was a lamb. The reason being is, at first, it's not even mentioned. It's just an animal. <clears throat> and then you go into the book of Exodus and you find out that it had to be a lamb. You remember the Passover night? They would take a lamb. They would set it out and they was to judge it. Take time to judge it. Just like they took Jesus all night from judge to judge. That had to be judged that there was no blemish in it. There was no spot on it. There was nothing wrong with it. He was judged. His judge said, I find no fault in him. Why? What evil have they done? Crucify him. I wash my hands of the innocent blood of this man. They, he, he was judged innocent. Even, even one of his, uh, uh, one of the Romans that persecuted him, mocked him, nailed him to the cross, said, surely this was the Son of God. Judas who betrayed him, I have betrayed innocent blood. He was judged clean without spot, without blemish. Then you read that it, not a bone was to be broken. When it come time, they was begged for the bodies to be taken off the cross. The Roman soldiers went and broke the legs of the other thieves, but Jesus had already passed away, so they didn't break his. Not a bone was broken. It was not to be sodden with water. Therefore, Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. He fulfilled every, everything that was commanded to be in that Passover lamb. And then later, jumping ahead in, in your Bible, jumping way ahead in your Bible, there shows up a man in the, uh, in, in, under Jesus' ministry named John the Baptist, and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God pointing at Jesus. Then in Revelation, when John is called up into heaven and he sees what's going on in heaven, and the revelation is the book of Revelation is revealed to him. He sees a lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, worthy to take the book from his hands who sit on the throne and loose the seals thereof. That lamb was Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So that's so that's his blood. And how are we saved today? By grace, putting our faith in the precious blood of Christ. Not by our vain conversation. Not from our baptism, our church membership, any rituals we do, any works we do. None of that saves us. Amen. Now, in the tribulation, it's going to be both. Let's keep going here. Uh, verse 20, let's keep going. I skipped a bunch of stuff here. It says, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, 
Before the world was, the Lord knew that man would fall. And he made a plan. And that plan was that he was going to he was going to come on, take on flesh, and he was going to die and be an innocent substitute. He was going to be the Lamb of God. He was going to do what Abraham said to Isaac. God will provide himself a lamb. He provided himself as the lamb through Jesus Christ. Are you with me? But was manifest in these last times for you. 1 Timothy 3.16 Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That was God's blood shed on Calvary. That is a, that's a strong verse on the Trinity when you tie it together like that. Verse 21. Who by Him do believe in God, who by Jesus do believe in God, that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now I read verses 20 and I, and I mentioned that before the foundations of the world were even laid, God knew we was going to fall and God knew He was going to send His Son to die. He made the plan then. And he just revealed little glimpses of his plan. He had those Old Testaments prophesying and writing down things and they didn't even know what they were writing sometimes. And they searched diligently trying to figure out what he was writing about. You say, no, I don't believe that. David wrote Psalms 22. And if you'll read Psalms 22, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He talks about dogs, that's Gentiles, have can cast me about. My bones are all out of joint. Talking about the sufferings he had on Calvary. He is describing being crucified. Was David ever crucified? No. Crucifixion wasn't even a form of capital punishment then. But he described it perfectly. How did he do it? The Lord told him what to say and they said it. Amen. We had the luxury of looking back and understanding that they were diligently seeking what in the world was he talking about? They wanted to understand it. Amen? But they weren't ministering to themselves. They were ministering unto us of the grace that was to come. Calvary. That's good. He revealed his plan slowly but surely. <clears throat> Now let's see, keep going. Uh, let's see, what did I say in verse 22? Obeying. Okay, in verse 22, here's a good thing. Seeing you purified your souls in obeying the truth. How do you obey the truth? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Belief in the gospel. Believing on the Lord is obeying the gospel. Okay? Acts 15, 11. How do you get a pure heart? By faith in Christ. Amen. Uh, let's keep going now. Uh, verse 23. Being born again. Woo! There's your hyper dispensationalist. Don't even like talking about that. See, because here, that's a reference to us. Is that not? Being born again, not of corruptible seed. Seed? What is that? That's the Word of God but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Men carry the seed and the seed produces life and the word of God is likened to a seed. And if you'll put your faith and trust in it, if you'll believe it, if you accept it, it'll bring forth life. That's amazing. And to show you that the seed is the Word of God, it says so right there in that verse. I mean, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. If that's not plain enough, you can go to Matthew 13, the parable of the sower. He went forth to sow seed in the field and talked about how the birds come and got some of it, how the sun came out and blistered some of it, how thorns and thistles grew up and choked out some of it, but good ground received it. And when he clarifies what all those symbolism all the symbolism is in that parable. He, like, he says that the seed is the Word of God. 
So the seed's the word of God. So when you get these preachers on TV saying, sow your seed today, send me 20 bucks, <laughs> you got an idiot. Right. Amen? <laughs> I mean, really. Verse 21. Uh, no, verse 24. Let's keep going. I'm trying to finish this because we've already spent like four weeks in chapter one. I was trying to get moving a little bit. Uh, verse 12. Uh, let's see. What did I say? Verse 24. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is as the flower of grass. The glory of man. Man, I have I run a marathon and I I, I got the gold. I I, I got uh, I don't know, I got what is that they football with that championship ring or all that all this glory that people get. <coughs> Somebody tell me, who won the Super Bowl? Three years ago. Can anybody tell me who won the Super Bowl three years ago? Who was the number one tennis player nine years ago? Who was the best golf player 12 years ago? Anybody know? Who was the best preacher 50 years ago? The glory of man faded. See, we're not here to bring glory to ourselves. We're here to glorify God and exalt Him. And if you spend all your time trying to get glory for yourself, it's going to vanish. It's going to fade. Nobody's going to remember. But what you do for Christ is going to be recorded in heaven. That's what lasts forever. Amen. Amen. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The flower lasts even shorter time than the grass. A lot of people lose their glory before they die. A lot of these great singers, they, they hit the top, I've been number one on the charts, and then they, you watch them just decline. Somebody comes and replaces them and they go down. And Then they're singing in nightclubs. Used to be number one billboard, used to have their names of bright lights, now they're singing in nightclubs. You know, just trying to get a few of the old people that they that remember them to come and hear them. Amen. Just be that's what it is. It says the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. Now that's from Isaiah forty, verses six through eight. The 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 next two verses. Uh, if you read Isaiah forty six through eight, he is basically quoting Isaiah. And then in verse 25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. Your glory and your life will fade, but the Bible will stand. Amen. Forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached in you. This is the word. Amen. By which the gospel, the word that's going to abide forever. The pure word. That's how you heard the gospel. Amen. And again, that's a quote from Isaiah 40, verses 6 through 8. The Word is eternal. You can see that in Psalms 119, verse 160. Psalms 12, He's promised to preserve. Psalms 12, verse 6 and 7, He promised to preserve it forever. We know that, uh, we know that the Word of God abideth forever. We know that not one jot or tittle shall fade away or pass away. Uh, Man's life is but a vapor that appeared for a moment, then vanished off the way. How I many of you ever cranked up a vehicle on a cold morning to see the vapor come out? It don't make it very far till it just dissipates and disappears. That's our life. It's just going to be a little vapor here for a little bit, then it's going to vanish away. It's going to vanish away. And he, he, he. He ain't the only one that said something like that back in James chapter 4 verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on tomorrow for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little, little time and then vanisheth away. Alright, any questions on that? I know there was a lot of stuff in there at the beginning. Any questions on, on James chapter 1? Any questions on any of this? I hope you understand that. And you, I, hope it, I hope it made sense to you. Especially this. They didn't see the church age. This, this was revealed to Paul. 
This is part of the revelation given to Paul. You know how, you know where, you know where Paul went to school? Paul went to school three years in the Old Testament. God, the Lord opened his eyes to the things that the prophets were looking into and couldn't see. He went back there and started reading in Isaiah and said, oh, that's the Lord, that's the Lord, that's the Lord. Where before he was saying it's us the Jews, him being the Pharisees, we're the ones suffering. We're the, he was, but after, after the Lord called him and opened his eyes, he could see Jesus. The first man in Acts 8 to be saved like you and me, the Ethiopian, what was he reading? He was reading in Isaiah. And what did Philip say? Understandest thou what thou readest? He says, how can I? He didn't understand it. So the, Philip opened, the Lord opened Philip eyes to it and he preached Jesus then to him. And he got saved. Amen? Alright. There's so much in that book it's just dumbfoundingly amazing. Alright, let's all stand.